Now, ladies and gentlemen, to start the evening off, please welcome the writer of the book and lyrics, Mr. Bill Russell. for angels, punks, and raging queens. We have the most amazing cast for you tonight. I mean, the collective credits of this group are just off the charts. And I'm going to be introducing them as we go along. But first, I have to make the most important introduction. We are so lucky tonight to have with us the composer of the music you're about to hear. She's also serving as our musical director and playing the piano. Give it up for Janet Hood! started writing 30 years ago, but we do not look at this as a period piece because truthfully, though AIDS and HIV have been pushed to the back burner of our cultural consciousness, the truth is it, it, the issue has not been conquered. And not too long ago, there was a survey done in Washington, D.C., where they discovered that the percentage of the population there infected with HIV was the equivalent of the worst hit African nations. And the infection rate in this country has uh, stayed relatively consistent since the mid-80s, though it's moved into different populations. So this is not a period piece, and we're always happy when it gets done, especially to um, tell young people about this history, this amazing history of this era. They are sadly uninformed about that, and many of them don't even know how you can contract HIV. So for all of those reasons, we feel this is a piece that deserves to continue to be done, and I'm happy to say it is. In 1987, AIDS was um, encroaching closer and closer into my circle of friends, and never have I felt the need to write about something like I did about this at that moment. And in October of that year, my husband, Bruce Bossard, who is here tonight, uh, as is Janet's partner, Mary Morse, and they have both, <laughs> they have both lived through all of this with us. Well, in 87, Bruce and I were at the initial unveiling of the Names Project quilt on the Washington Mall. And I had been writing a kind of free verse for years and was interested in doing a larger project in that form. And also, I was very familiar with Edgar Lee Masters' Spoon River Anthology, which is a collection of short free verse epitaphs published in 1915. And they're all uh, in the voices of characters who have died and are in this cemetery in this fictional town in Illinois. And I had the idea of writing a Spoon River of AIDS, but with the quilt being the metaphor. And if you don't know the name's Project Quilt, please Google it, because it's an incredible piece of community art. Um, so I started writing these monologues in the voices of people I knew who were sick or um, had died, and, or even people who weren't sick, but all of us at that point felt we could be. And after I had a handful of them, I called Janet. I said, um, would you be interested in writing some songs to go with these? Because I think there are some theatrical possibilities here. And uh, she said, yes, immediately. And that was inspired also. Spoon River was um, adapted for the stage in the 50s, and they incorporated classic American folk songs, but I thought we could write an original score. So when we had a dozen monologues and a handful of songs, I put together a reading in New York with four male actors and a female singer, because at that point all the characters were male. And um, that was very well received. And one of the actors in it, oh, it was also the model for Spoon River was always a small cast with the actors playing multiple roles. Well, one of the actors in the reading, Justin Ross, who is here tonight, uh, took, yeah, took the, um, the piece 
introduce to Kevin Maloney, who is still the artistic director of a downtown theater company called Tweed, the wildest entertainments ever devised. And they were doing a spring festival in New Orleans, and they said, look, we would love to do elegies, but we owe a lot of actors favors. So would you consider casting one person in each role? And I was like, oh my God, yeah. Organizing five actors for a reading leaves me just tearing my hair out, so I couldn't possibly do that. But, because uh, this would be 30 to 35, and, um, but they just kept at me, and one night I woke up and I thought, well, how many times am I going to get to work with a cast this size? And uh, I felt like I had jumped off a cliff, but we dived in, and it turned out to be the most extraordinary experience. This was 1989 in Soho. And it was the white hot center of the war on AIDS. And almost everyone in the cast had a uh, personal connection to the subject matter. The few who didn't soon did because we had actors hospitalized during rehearsals. Mark Fotopoulos, the Broadway gypsy, had car uh, carpalosis, so color lesions all over his body. Uh, and it just turned into this incredibly intense and oddly enough for something that came from such sadness, joyous experience, which putting this together has always proven to be. So, our first section is gonna start with Emma Hutton, followed by me doing the opening monologue. Then we have a monologue featuring Justin Collette, a quartet comprised of sideshow alumni from the recent revival. They are Ben Andrews, Claire Ross, Lauren Elger and Javier Ignacio. Then a monologue by Nick Adams, followed by the Skibbies. A monologue then by Hunter Ryan Hurtlicka, and a song featuring Josh Young. And then I will be back. And now please welcome Emma Hunt.
party exactly as I planned. With a chunk of my estate in hand, they mentioned my favorite restaurant, drank champagne and margaritas, <laughs> laughed at memories as tears and beers were spilt, unveiled my panel for the quilt, and then went dancing and tossed my ashes like confetti on that ballroom floor where we had played and Late before. Oh, we did. Know how. To parte! <laughs> we heard the sound of sirens in the city calling us to join the dance and met in heavy days of liberation from our fears, a late night celebration of how right it felt to say, I am here and I am here. <laughs> Yes, yes, we sometimes went too far. Too many drugs, too many men. <laughs> but when that world began to die, I marveled at the way those movers of the stylish scenes, the stunning hunks, the disco queens, became the leaders of the fight. Ever constant flames of light in death's long and lonely night. The the focus of my younger days was largely split between dad's body shop and sewing on mom's old machine. <laughs> Me, the track and field star working on my souped up car, then whipping up fantastic frocks. Oh, not for me or anyone. I always kept them under locks, but later on those skills of sewing and design led to a Modicum of fame, and many women wore my name. <laughs> when I found out my life would end from AIDS, I began to sew the panel which would show my name upon this quilt. As I survey all the thousands honored here, I wish that I could throw them all a party to celebrate the lives they had. Oh, do not be sad. You who are living still have love to give and troubled hearts to fill with hope. We, the dead, are free of fear and strife and of the mysteries of life. Here we're gathered in a mad collage, the heroes with the uh, not so great, <laughs> Those who the disease took early, those who it took late. All the interrupted lives I propose, we celebrate! Yeah! Ooh! <laughs> Tripping on a beach in Provincetown. <laughs> The day was gray, the light diffused, whatever substance we had used made the tiny, made the hues on the tiny rocks along the shore glow like gems in Harry's store. <laughs> so there we were, uh, Billy, Patrick, Joe and Doug and me, loony as five guys can be, just jumping up in ecstasy over each discovery of another stone whose amazing colors we would discover alone, then share with the others. <laughs> Ooh. Ah! <laughs> Someone then had a revelation that the unique configuration of each design was made more remarkable when the stone was wet. <laughs> so we put it in our mouths. Mm. This sufficed more easily than crossing over to the sea. <laughs> You're as loony as can be. Demosthenes! I yelled. Demosthenes! Take those marbles out of your mouth! I ate your dinner. <laughs> we screamed and carried on. Oh, how we'd laugh at times like those. Sad we were with us. Times came to close. Uh, first, Joe got sick. We mourned him so, then the rest began to go. The grief subsiding not one bit.
before another friend was hit. Uh, when I succumbed, I fought the darkness which numbed my mind by focusing on when we shined that day on the beach. And my last request to Doug, besides a healthy hug, was that he take my charred remains and toss them off that strip of shore to be with the pebbles evermore. I was ugly as could get. And I thought I would look better wet.
the outfit? <laughs> Simple. Striking. Understated, but effective. One night at the Velvet Rope, the fucking bouncer ignored me. So I went around the corner, stashed my well-considered ensemble behind some shrubbery, and strutted to the door wearing just my Calvins and my gym rat bod. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> that velvet rope lifted quicker than an aging starlet's face. <laughs> Once inside, all the daddies and the twinks down their drinks and lined up for the ride. Sometimes after BB, PNP, &P, and all the other acronyms of variegation, and drugs, and sexual experimentation, we would laugh at Old Queen's warnings that we should take to heart the lessons learned by every ancient fart about the horror years of AIDS and how they manned the barricades. Yawn. <laughs> I mean, who gives a shit? Didn't science conquer it? Apparently not. <laughs> when I found out what I got, I went on an online binge. Craigslist and Grindr, every kind of manhunt finder. Hooking up with curious jerks and desperate gays. Crystal meth and sex for days. <laughs> I post a pic, posed like this. And in an instant nanosec, my inbox would be flooded. I dig big. Make me your pig. So off I'd go and let the deadly rivers flow. I'd finish and he'd say, Mmm, mmm, daddy, that was good. I'd crack a grin and then drop this little bulletin. Boy, it could be said I fucked you to death. Because I have AIDS, and so do you. Yeah, boy, now you've got it too. I'll let that sink in a bit. Wait for tears, a little shit. And then I quit the lousy fuck small room, log on again, and look for other men to do. Flying in and out of my door, but I 
My sister went through men faster than I did. Well, almost. Some of hers were losers. Some were boozers. Some were cute. But one of them was a real beaut. That was Brian. Husband number three. Or four. I don't remember anymore. He lasted longer than the rest, but not forever. It was best. Somehow, he became my friend. And we survived the end of their relationship. We shared the common bond of loving sand and water, framed by a frond or two of a palm, hot, bright sun, and the balm of island breezes. We dreamed of moving to the tropics, of leaving the aroma there in soggy old Tacoma. Now don't misconstrue, he was hetero, through and through, but we could do most anything together and have a real good time. Uh, baseball. Okay, I'm hitter. I'm hit. Bat. Oh, the bat. Kind of like ball. When I confessed how messed up I was inside, he took action, called in sick, said, pick your island, flew us to a beach like that where we just sat, and watched the tide come in and out, discuss what life was all about. And after we returned home, he discovered all sorts of ways to help. How to change my soaking sheets without disturbing all the tubes. How to give the medications. How to fight dull administrations of hospitals and agencies and when to bark and when to bite. And when to hold my hand so tight I'd see beyond my fading sight of all the friends I had. Brian was the straightest. <laughs> and certainly the greatest. Regular kind of guy 
power of my sky, learn to party, but never learn to cry. And even now, my tears won't move there, painted on a clown. And the rain keeps falling down. seems to weep with far less reason, but I can't cry at home. Thought the sky would cry itself dry by this time. Might wash away this godforsaken town, but the rain keeps falling down. Yes, the rain. Keeps falling Well, that initial production in Soho was really well received, and I think we all felt that was incredible, but it will never happen again. Because you can imagine going to a producer with this project. Oh, I've got this great show. Oh, really? Tell me about it. Well, it has an enormous cast. It's written in verse, and it's about AIDS. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, somehow it, it touched people and it kept getting done. And Justin Ross, that actor who took it to the first company, moved to LA and he produced a production there, uh, directed by Ken Page. And a couple of gentlemen came to see it who became key parts in the history of this piece. They were Giacomo Capasano and Kevin Garrity. Giacomo uh, got a hold of me and said, my lover died of AIDS a year ago, and I have never, I've avoided anything about the subject matter. I never saw a longtime companion, I never saw the quilt, but I ended up at your show and I can't get it out of my head, and I would like to produce it in London. And even though he had no experience producing, he did produce it in London, and we started in a French theater called the King's Head in Islington. It's in the back of this pub. And uh, it has a stage about this size, and I had a cast of 33. Um, to this day, the largest cast ever on that stage, and tonight, I think, is the largest cast ever on this stage. So it's continuing a trend. Anyway, the art when I got there for rehearsals, the artistic director was showing me around the theater. And his name was Dan Crawford. He was born in New Jersey, but he was more British than any Brit you ever met. He was like a Dickens character, you know? And uh, he takes me backstage, and there's this dressing room which could hold maybe eight people. 
and I asked him, and I said, well, Dan, where are the rest of them going to get dressed? And he took me upstairs to the offices, and he said, oh, they can all get dressed up here. And I said, great, there's a lot of space. But how do they get backstage? Because from what I can see, there's uh, the only way is through the house. And he said, no problem. They climb out this window, <laughs> go across the roof, and then climb down a ladder, and they're backstage. And I said, Dan, it's November. What if it rains? And he went, <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, well, but will you tell the cast this? Because if this were America, they wouldn't bother to report me to the union. They would just have me killed. You know? And he said, oh, no, it won't be any problem. They won't mind. And sure enough, they were getting paid subway fare. It was an incredible group of actors, many of whom went on to great, great stuff, including Brendan Coyle, who played Mr. Bates on Downton Abbey. And, um... The show was really, really well received and extended at the King's Head and then Giacomo moved it to the Drill Hall, which was the gay theater in London at the time. And then Kevin and Giacomo moved it to the Criterion Theater in the West End. Now until that point, we had always just done it with piano, usually with Janet playing, because she can make it sound like an orchestra. But... Uh, <laughs> wasn't going to be able to do the West End engagement, so we decided to do these orchestrations, which were created by James Raitt, who also did Forever Plaid and Pageant, actually, and uh, unfortunately died from AIDS uh, shortly after he did this work. Um, that it, West End production really raised the uh, commercial profile over in Europe, and consequently it's done all the time in the UK especially. All the drama schools do it because there's so many roles, right? And uh, it, I'm very happy all of that happened. So our next, <laughs> our next section will start with Emerson Davis, followed by a duet featuring Emily Padgett and Haven Burton. Then we have a monologue by Luba Mason, followed by Nora Schell, a monologue by Damon Green, followed by a quartet consisting of David McDonald, uh, Frank Viveros, Crystal Kellogg, and Stephanie, no, not Stephanie, Janine DeVita. And then I will be back. So please now welcome currently starring on Broadway in Once on This Island, Emerson Davis. Not 
a little trick to find out who your friends really are. <laughs> Contract a terminal illness <laughs> and then tell everyone that you have it. Make a list, cross off those who insist on asking, how did you get it? And then under the heading of friends who are true, mark those who ask, what can I do? My news caused such a flurry of liberal concern at the company where I was pointed to with pride as proof executives in charge of sales did not entirely consist of Caucasian males. Oh, the rallying round of well-intentioned types who really show their stripes by asking the wrong questions. And those that did were banished from the realm. And I was virtually alone with my careering life, wondering what the hell I'd do when the killer, coursing through my body, reached full concentration. Then my secretary. Something of a sight. <laughs> An outfit's more appropriate for night. Closed the door, burst into tears, then apologies. Having worked for me for years, she knew my moods, my needs, and every fear instinctively and made my life of dying that much easier for me. Oh, she was there. Showed her genuine concern and care by reading to me when I became too ill to do so on my own. Oh, I requested Proust and Wolf and Gertrude Stein and she tried. <laughs> she could not get through two sentences of those. But as an alternative, she chose books that she had read her own children. And soon I knew every fairy tale, every kitty ditty by heart, and then she'd start again. Oh, and I would sigh, go back. You have a life, and your family needs feeding. But she would just continue reading, and only stopped when I did too. The company threw a tasteful little service that she was not invited to, and then they laid her off. Yes, they treated her, my one true friend, worse than they did me. But she will have my gratitude for all eternity.
hospital lady asks my social security number. <laughs> Ain't got one. Don't do me no good on the street. <laughs> social worker lady, she looked beat and say, you should call these people. And I do, because it seemed like there might be a buck or two somewhere for me. So this white boy, <laughs> blushing honky red, come by, say you do the paperwork. Sure enough, I get some bread. But then he kept coming back. Even when I'm out, lying around my crib, rub his nose all the time like the smell of my room bothering him or something. And he gets upset with me when I score some shit to make me happy. He played punky judge and jury and flushed that stuff in one big hurry. When I get bad, he take me to emergency at Bellevue. Crazies and cuffs, kids bleeding and stuff. And I want some smoke. And he says, uh, you can't smoke in here. <laughs> I say, you such a white boy, will me behind that curtain. <laughs> so he do. <laughs> and I get my smoke. <laughs> One time, I say, Sonny, I'm gonna steal money from the nurses' purses because I'm hip to where they kept. And he get pissed off and say, oh, 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 oh. You do that, and those nurses will fuck you over like you've never been fucked over before. <laughs> A door opened in my head. I sit up in bed. Hey, you a faggot? <laughs> He looked at me hard and said, some people call us that. <laughs> Eat too much. Some people call us that. <laughs> what? He I. And the sight of him at my funeral in the Bronx made me laugh. <gasps> Only white boy. Everybody scream and carry on. Hey, that faggot? Blushing honky red, kept coming back, even when I'm dead. <laughs>
we indeed do need heroes right now. And that uh, last monologue and lyric were inspired by my personal heroes here tonight. Thank you, Lenorki Campbell, for all you do. <laughs> which is called Unexpected Joy, is going to start performances in April at the York Theater. So keep your ears and eyes open for Unexpected Joy and come see our newest work. Um, we're, we have one more segment here that I don't want to interrupt, so I need to make some thank yous right now. First of all, what about this cast? Yeah. And a cast like this does not just magically come together, let me tell you. I am so, so grateful to the, our brilliant casting director, Stephen DeAngelo. Yeah. Needs some wrangling, and I've been supported by a wonderful stage manager, Pam Eddington. Thank you to Justin Ross for his help with some of our musical staging, and thank you to everyone here at 54 Below. I love, I love working here. Jennifer Tepper and Katrin Hardy. Yes, thank you. Especially thank you all for coming. And if tonight should inspire you in any way to want to contribute time or money, there is no better organization than Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. <laughs> so our final segment will start with Jenny Lee Stern, followed by a song led by Kissy Simmons and supported by Paul Castry. Terry Kelly, Stephanie Gibson, and Tally Sessions. Then we have a monologue by Andrew Keenan Bolger, followed by Emily Skinner. I will do the short second part of the monologue I did earlier. And then we have Max Crum, followed by T. Oliver Reed, who will be the finale. Thank you so much for being here, and now please welcome Jenny Lee Stern. <laughs> prognosis. It's time to do you some heavy shopping! <laughs> Go ahead, buy like mad everything you wish you had. <laughs> Take your plastic and go crazy!
beside me at your grave and trying to be brave as you were lowered in the ground. <laughs> what a lonely, shocking sound. And then your parents turned around and said, you are a disgrace. We never want to see your face again. And uh, the stress of knowing that the earth would not caress us there together put me well under the weather. <clears throat> My sister I took a leave of absence, nursed me to my end, then took an even longer stay to remain here by the bay and fight in court. She would not leave until she could retrieve your body. At last, we lie together and leave behind this legacy. Surely there is no dichotomy as good and bad is family. My brother lived in San Francisco. He said, he finally found his 
surrounding it, fought each invader of my body, fought my fear of death and the unknown. But the fight sustained and connected me with others who were fighting too, made life as rich as it had ever been. You, who hear me now and also fight, you who know the terror of the night, also know that you are living with, not dying from. And that thin line between your world and mine is an illusion. For on either side of that divide, the truth is we are going on. <coughs> My friends, time will have its way, and all of us must leave, but not before. One final tale, 
one story more of lessons difficult to know. Not giving up, but letting go. I fought the end with all my strength, you know, determined to extend the length of this, <laughs> my time. I struggled so to catch each breath, but I would not be caught by death. <coughs> Douglas! <coughs> Sitting there in that awful metal chair where he'd been for months, it seemed. Had it really been that long? I dreamt it all. <laughs> this pallid room, this antiseptic base perfume. No. He'd been there all along. Knowing love would make me strong. And then finally, he held me. Close and so tight, seeming hours in the night. Then he whispered, Let it go. You are fabulous, you know. <laughs> you have done and given all you could. When none of us would blame you if you call it quits. This is what true love permits. The strength to say goodbye when you are tired. Too tired to try. It wasn't hard to slip away, Douglas holding me that way. I think I smiled <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> Knowing love had never died. <laughs> Oh,
Yeah. 